Well, I'm glad to see everyone. Um, I'm happy that everyone had a, a lovely weekend. Uh, we have a tremendous amount that we need to get through today, so we're just going to jump in. As a small, simple reminder, I am live streaming today, so if you want to go back in and get a good refresher on the ideas and the concepts that we just explored in class, please do so. Go find me on my YouTube channel. Um, I've been live streaming all week so far, so good, without any problems, which I, I'm thankful for. YouTube has a tendency to change things without telling anyone that they've changed things. There's been many a semester where I come in and I fire up YouTube, I fire up all my streaming stuff, and then somewhere on the back end of YouTube they've made a change and nothing works. So I'm happy that it's been pretty seamless this semester. Um, I wanted to start the day just by kind of cruising over and exploring to a certain degree uh, what we're going to be doing this week. As a perhaps not so subtle reminder, <laughs> um, your homework was due today, so get that stuff in. Um, I'm probably going to start grading that assignment here very, very shortly. So please make sure you have an opportunity to get that in. We're going to be having two main uh, missions this week. Okay, If we go into the week two module on can oops, clearly I thought I had published it. Let me publish this real fast. on one second. Actually, there's two. All right, hopefully Canvas is working now. Let's refresh. Yeah, okay. <sighs> okay, I apologize. All of this stuff is supposed to be off because they're broken links, and I just discovered that. So these will pop in. Uh, these will go away, all these links to these. Uh, these are videos. I have to fix the links, and I don't know why they're broken, but those were not supposed to be there. However, let's just jump in and start looking at the two assignments that we're going to be working with today. Okay, you have a goal this week. And our goal simply is to create this train. Okay, so we're just going to jump right in. The training wheels are officially off, <laughs> uh, and you guys are making a train this week. Okay, 
Now we're going to start with baby steps. We're not going to jump in and do something really, really kind of super detailed. We'll get to that here in a minute. So we're going to start off with a simple exploration of form and shape. Okay. Since this is kind of our really first big assignment, I want to walk you through some of the ideas and uh, some, of the, some of the points that I put in our assignment sheets. The shape shorter and the unit primitive labs, those were kind of mechanical exercises. This is going to be our first big, our first big model, a creative exercise that, that has some expectations, some direct expectations um, that we need to be ironing out. Okay? Specifically, I'm always going to give you a bullet point list of what I'm, and what I'm asking you guys to achieve in that homework assignment. Uh, I have no idea why my computer's doing that. Yeah, was it, were those post beeps? I don't Maybe. Know. Okay. Post -beeps. Um, uh oh, when your when your BIOS physically starts beeping at you, that's not usually a good sign. <laughs> um, so I'm always always going to give you a bulleted list of what you're what you're striving to achieve on all of these assignments, okay? So please use this as an excellent, excellent reference of what it is that we're trying to do. So for this model <laughs> specifically, you're going to be making a model of the locomotive and the coal car, all the railroads and the railroad ties. Um, we're going to talk a lot about centering and the role of the origin inside of our scene today. There's also going to be an expectation that you use the, the backdrop items that I provided you with, okay? We'll come back to some of these details later. Point being is that come back to the assignment sheet to really get a laser focused understanding of what I'm expecting you to do. Okay? Um, okay. In addition, I'm almost always going to give you some samples. This is what it should look like at the conclusion of your work today. Um, for this particular assignment, I actually have given you guys a really cool, I love, I love this service. It's called SketchUp. Uh, excuse me, it's called Sketchfab. I always mix up. There is actually a 3D modeling app called SketchUp. The service that I'm using is called Sketchfab, okay? And then I can embed a cool 3D model inside the browser, which is pretty neat. And we can look around it, fly around, check it out. So this is another great resource to help you understand what it is that we're trying to build, okay? Um, I definitely encourage you to go check out Sketchfab. Uh, it's a great, great platform. As students, you get a free academic version, which is pretty rad. Um, and uh, you know, for us in the 3D business, it's it's pretty fantastic. Okay, um, I use Sketchfab a lot, um, and I'm a big fan of it. So, not every project is going to get a cool Sketchfab embedded 3D example. Some will, some won't. Okay, and then down at the oh, some some projects will have resources. We'll come back to that here in a second. There's actually something I need you to download and look at for this homework assignment. But there's also, probably most importantly, a series of naming conventions that I would like you to follow. Okay? So look towards these naming conventions, copy and paste, replace last name with your last name, that'd be helpful. Um, if you follow these naming conventions, it makes it a whole lot easier for me to grade these things on the back end. Okay? Um, keep in mind, I got, you know, what, 150 students this semester. Okay? Every single student, every single week, is submitting four separate files. Okay? I have 600 data points that I now have to manage per week, okay? Please follow the naming conventions. Please follow the naming conventions. <laughs> it really makes it easier, a whole lot easier on my side if, uh, if things are organized as such. And there's a method to the madness, too. There's a reason why we have naming conventions that are like this, okay? Out there in the real world, how we name things is really important. We don't do this type of work in a vacuum. It's often a team sport. We work on very large production crews. And we need to make sure that the assets that we create integrate, if you will, into that production pipeline very cleanly. So good practice and something that I've been doing for a long, long time, professionally and personally, is that I start with the most general description of what this file is all about, right? You can't get more general than your last name, right? This file belongs to me, okay? Well, what is this file used for? Well, it's used for a GCOM class, okay? Well, which GCOM class? GCOM 402. Which assignment in GCOM 402 was the basic train? So if you, th if you follow the logic, we go from the most general kind of understanding of this file to the most specific understanding of this file in one file name. It's very, very helpful, okay? It's a great system. I encourage you to use it. One of the hardest things that you're going to have to kind of learn to manage is your media, okay? If you think about it, you're making four files a week. You times that by 16. That's just a lot of data. Okay, that you're going to have to organize and keep track of. So keep track of it. 
You know, this is, this is part of how we earn our union card, as they say, right? This is part of our job. Um, how went the submission for your homework in your lab assignment last week? Did anyone run into a show-stopping problem that stopped them from submitting? That's right, because when we save it, we save it in two different spots. We save a JPEG from the render window, and then over in Modo, to save an LXO or to create an LXO is under the File menu, Save At. So two different places. Yeah. Yeah, question. Is it okay to take a picture and submit it as JPEG? I'm confused. Why don't you just save the JPEG? Yeah, they'll save you a step, right? Okay. Um, yeah, because everything we render, we can save. Okay, we don't, have, we don't have to take a JPEG of it or a screenshot of it. All right, other show stopping problems from last week that we need to resolve? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, I already resolved it, but I want to show it Yeah, we'll manage you individually, it's no problem. How do you reshape easy? Yeah. Like last week, when we just simply clicked on the shape and we just simply expanded it. Keyboard shortcuts are the same. So the, the trick that you need to remember. But I, made, I made it more, I did it, but I made it way more difficult than I needed it to be. Okay. <laughs> okay, so last week we were working with our teapot. And one of the challenges of working inside of 3D is understanding that we're actually manipulating this information within a hierarchy, okay? Last week we touched very briefly on the topmost element inside of that hierarchy. Does anyone remember what that is? And I wish I have ordered, or we are moments from ordering a gigantic whiteboard, so I apologize for the fo those folks on the screen that can't see me writing over here. Um, yeah, so you're in the right ballpark, right? So, um, so the topmost element in our scene is called an item. Right? Everything is an item first. Think of this like when we're trying to describe a car. Everything is a car first, right? But really a car is made up of a whole bunch of, a whole series of component parts and pieces, right? What would be the component parts and pieces of your car? Steering Chassis, steering wheel. Of course you have, have to have a good stereo in your car. All of these things are different per car, but we still describe them as a car. Everything's a car first, and then we get more detailed, right, with the component pieces inside of our mesh. Our geometry is the exact same, thing, exact same way. Everything is an item first, so we can select things at the item level, and then we get a little bit more granular. All models are made up of three basic building blocks. We have vertices, I'm just gonna put verts, edges, and polygons, okay, and polys. The three basic building blocks of every 3D model, okay. Let's get a little bit more specific, and this is a long-winded uh, answer to your question, Levi, but I think it's going to be helpful, okay. At the top of our modeling layout in Moto, of course, naturally, we can see those different selection sets. I can transition between verts, edges, and polygons. However, and this is a little hidden, and I apologize for this, or the foundries should apologize for this, they assume that if nothing is selected like that, you're in item mode. You're selecting the entirety of our shape, okay? The teapot is such a wonderful example of this because it's actually three separate pieces, the spout, the middle section, and the handle, okay? So if we were to work in item mode, as we are now, I can move it around and the entire group moves, okay? I can hit the E key and rotate the entire group, okay, the entire item. Think of like a container or a bucket, okay? Or I can change a little bit, and maybe I want to just move a couple verts around on my model. So I go into my vertex selection state, and it's you know I'm going to do something to change my viewport ever so slightly to make my vertices visible, okay? Because right now they're invisible; they're actually there. And if you look carefully, when we roll over a vert, you get that little blue cube. That's a vert. Uh, if you want to start following along, hit the O key. Your O key will bring up in your viewport properties, which is going to determine how this viewport is being drawn by the computer. And inside of the active meshes section, 
independent point size, okay? Make that, oops, a little, perhaps too big. Let's put that to 15. And I also want to put show vertices. Let's put uh, in vertex mode. Whoa, maybe 15 was a little too big. Let's try 10. There we go. So all of those dots on my mesh are my verts. Those dots are my verts. Now, a vertice can be simply described as just a point in space. By itself, it's kind of meaningless. Sure. The part about showing, turning on your vertices? Yeah. So to get to that form, that little popover, hit the O key. O is in October. You'll get this. Now, and I traveled to the active meshes section, kind of down towards the bottom. And I did two things. In the show vertices section right here, I turned mine to in vertex mode, but you're more than welcome to do it in component mode as well. Either of those two options will be just fine. And then just to make it bigger, for the folks in the back to see, I turned on the independent point size just to make the, the computer draw the verts bigger. At, with it off, the verts are there. There's very tiny black dots all over my mesh. And now I can see them. By itself, a vertice is kind of pointless. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really have a very large function inside of the modeling workflow. In other workflows, very important. When you're working with particles or replicators, those points actually have a specific function inside of those systems. But for modelers, which you guys are, okay, they're really kind of worthless. Okay? So we need to start adding them together. And if we go all the way back to high school geometry, okay, 10th grade geometry, I know it's difficult for some people because it's been a long, long time for some. You know, that has been in high school geometry. For others, that was like last year, right? And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? But if you start taking two points and you connect them, what do you create? Kind of. In our world, it's called an edge, okay? When we have two points, okay, two dots inside of our scene that have a relationship, we create an edge between them. And I think the classical sense is called a ray or maybe a ray. I don't know. I can't remember. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, this is an edge. We can select our verts. We can also select our edges, Okay, which is pretty cool. Now, one, one dot is a vert. Two dots together is an edge. Three dots is where it starts to get fun, and we start creating surfaces, otherwise known as polygons, inside of our scene. Okay? Um, if I go to the top of the screen and hit the polygon selection button, I now can grab and select all these surfaces inside of my, inside of my environment. Now, a three-sided surface is what? You know it. Triangle, right? Here's one, two, three. Three verts all associated with a surface. That's a triangle, OK? It's the most simple surface type. It's been around forever. We're kind of losing the taste for triangles. We want to try to avoid them as much as we can. They create really odd pinchings in our mess. Uh, they're not like, you know, uh, you know they're, they're, they're going to be a part of our modeling workflow. We want, we want to try to avoid them as much as we can. It is a little bit. Yeah, these faces over here are beginning to bend a little bit. This model is actually a special type of surface called a subdivision surface, which starts to bend the, the surface. It kind of puts it, puts it under tension. Is it, is it, is it, it is, and I can show you that. If you wanted to see it, the actual polygons, you just hit the tab key. There's the actual geometry. Sub-Ds allows. We'll talk about a lot about sub-Ds in the future, but it allows us to uh, uh, bend our geometry. Okay distorted a little bit, which is pretty cool. Okay, So triangles are OK. They're the most simple uh, surface type out there. Our graphics cards, the only reason they're kind of around to this very day is because of our graphics cards. Our graphics cards uh, love triangles. Why? Why do, we ha why, do, why do graphics cards love a three-sided surface versus a quad polygon, which has four sides? It is, and it, it, that is the, the exclusive explanation for it, because it's easier to crunch, a poly, crunch the numbers for a surface that has three points versus four. That's it. That's the only reason why graphics cards love triangles and prefer triangles, and why everything is triangulated when it gets rendered off the graphics card, because it's just easier and faster to crunch the numbers. Right? It's not because it's better. <laughs> 
Um, however, we in the, uh, in the 3D modeling business, right, what we really love is called a quad, -sided, a quad polygon, a four-sided surface like this. These are the, the creme de la creme, the gold standard, okay? This is the most flexible surface type out there. It's the most extensible, it's the most usable, it's the most cross-platform. You can send this mesh between any 3D application, and this geometry is going to be understood, shaded correctly, and deformed correctly. It is the best, okay? Uh, in addition, it also serves our direct purpose for our graphics cards, right? I can easily transform any square into two triangles. How? Cut it in half. Cut it in half. You got it. Which makes, which, which is another reason why quad polygons are as powerful and as, uh, is, uh, there we go. So, rectangle, simply dividing it in half diagonally creates a surface over here and a surface over there. So quads are the best. We love quad polygons, okay? Our sculpting apps, like ZBrush and Mudbox and 3D Coat, they prefer quad polygons, okay? Their entire architecture is built around quad polygons. So it really is the most powerful surface type out there and one that I'm going to be directly kind of in, 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 developing with you guys over the next uh, 15 weeks. Now there is one more surface type inside of Modo, and this is something that's relatively new and is not as widespread supported out there in the industry. And it's called an N-GON, right? Specifically what I'm saying here. An N-GON, like this. N-GON. Now in your, al in your algebra class, when you saw the N symbol, what did that mean? Yeah, it's a variable, it's a number, it's interchangeable, right? We can, we can swap that number in and out uh, at any time. Uh, we can do the same thing. Basically, in our, word, in, in our world, an n-gon is a surface that has more than four verts associated with it. It could be a surface that has five, or it could be a surface that has 25, okay? That's an n-gon. Now, uh, in the world of computer graphics, these are okay, but at the end of the day, everything either needs to be transformed into a quad polygon, a po quad polygon or a triangle. Okay, um, so we work with n-gons. They show up from time to time, but we have to do some work to get them into the right surface format so that we can continue working through the production pipeline. All right. Oops, excuse me. So those are our, our component pieces. We have items, which is everything. You can select the entire item move it around. I have verts, which I can select and I can move those verts around and see how I'm just influencing that part of the mesh. We have edges. And of course we have our polygods. Ah, pretty cool, huh? Those are, the, those are the different levels or the different uh, the elements inside of Moto that we're going to be working with to, to make our geometry. Okay. Um, now, part of working inside of Modo is managing this really great selection engine. We saw this a little bit last week, and I, I, mean, I know that you guys definitely saw it in your homework. But selecting things in Modo is kind of one of our bread and butter tasks, okay? You're going to find that you're going to be navigating around your scene, you know, panning, orbiting, and zooming, and then selecting things like every other second, okay? Because we have a lot of individual geometry that we need to manipulate and move and rotate and edit. Um, so we're going to be doing selecting often. Now last week we touched very briefly on the selection engine. I wanted to expand that a little bit today and start and start diving into some of the details. Okay, I hope that you're following along because this is something that it really helps if you get your hands dirty with it a little bit. Okay, Moto has a wonderful selection engine. Like I'm really happy with the selection engine. It's very very refined, very modern. I bring this to your attention because not every selection engine is as awesome as ours. Okay. Uh, some of them are, are very archaic from the early days of uh, the computer graphics industry. I'm looking at you, Maya. Maya's an app, by the way. It's an old 3D animation app. It's kind of a really big one. Anyways, let's talk about our selection engine. To make, sure, to make it real easy, please note that I'm in my polygonal selection mode. And uh, like we explored last week, I simply can just left click on any one of these polygons and select them. Now this orange color 
is really important. You're going to see this application wide. What does this orange color represent inside of Moto? Yeah, that it is selected. And Moto has, a, it has an underlying mantra. It's a principle, if you will, that whatever is selected will be edited, right? If nothing is selected, everything is going to be edited. So if I just have this one polygon selected and I fire off the rotate tool, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm just going to rotate that one polygon, which is cool, right? Okay, let's just do it real fast, okay? Fire off the rotate tool. Whatever is selected will be edited. Boom, there's a tool. Rotate. And I'm hitting the E key on my keyboard to activate the rotate. And I'm just rotating. Well, I've, now I've messed it up. That's weird. So I'll hit undo, okay? However, if I deselect that polygon, okay, for those of you that stumbled upon it, how do I deselect something? Escape. You can hit escape. That's, that's one way of doing it. What's, in a, what's in a really easy way of doing it? Spacebar is not actually deselecting it, okay? And we'll come back to this, piece, this spacebar thing here in a minute, okay? The spacebar cycles your selection sets, okay? We'll come back to that. But another fast, easy way, another fast, easy way of deselecting it, just clicking in the background of your scene. Boop, and it goes away. So now that I have deselected that one polygon, what's going to happen now if I fire off the rotation tool? Yeah, everything, because nothing is selected, so everything is going to be manipulated, and the entire teapot moves, okay? Moto is built around that core idea, and you're going to find that 100% of the tools and the workflows kind of is built upon that mantra, that principle, that whatever is selected will be edited. If nothing is selected, everything will be edited. No lines in the teapot. I think this was an enterprising student from earlier today that turned off their wireframes. You guys have both the blessing and the curse of coming in after our advanced class. So those, those guys and gals often customize things. So Meredith can't see any of the wireframes, any of these lines, any of these guys on her model. This is a viewport property, okay? If you hit the O key, uh, here we go. Under the O key, let's see, and it is under active meshes, this wireframe overlay. Was yours set to none? Uh, yeah, it yeah. Zero to okay. Yep. So I have it at color and at 10%, and that should put the wireframes back on there. Did that work, Meredith? Yeah. Great. Rock and roll. Cool. All right. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's continue to explore our selection engine, because this is an important idea for us. Now, going in and selecting just individual surfaces, that's pretty cool. Okay, I can select them. I'm on my way. But what if I wanted to select a whole bunch of them, right? Well, Moto at its core has what's called a paint selection system, where instead of just single left clicking, I can left click and drag on the model, and wherever my cursor goes, the polygons underneath the cursor are going to be selected. See, I'm left clicking and drag. I'm holding down the left mouse button. That's pretty cool. Makes it easy to go in and get what we need. Now, what if we goof a little bit here? Uh, and I got too many. Do I have to redo my selection? No. How do I deselect something without dropping the entire selection? Basically, how do I subtract a polygon from a, an existing selection? Shift, like Photoshop, will add. I'm holding down Shift now. Yeah, and also like Photoshop, if you hold down Control, we can subtract. Okay, cool, huh? Single left clicking in the background of the scene, we'll drop the selection, and we'll move on. Okay, pretty cool, huh? In addition, the teapot is actually made up of three discontiguous model pieces. You're going to see very directly here with our train that we're going to build that we're not just making one model, we're making like 800 models that are all kind of smushed together, okay? Uh, if we wanted to, we could select a single piece, okay? And I'm in polygon mode still. If you double click, see how it selects the entire piece? This is a contiguous model where all the verts and the surfaces are welded together, okay? This model is actually three separate pieces. I got the, the spout, the body, and the handle. Now, our selection engine 
works the same with these discontiguous, pi this discontiguous pieces. So I can double click. Let's pretend I wanted to get the, I want, oops, I forgot the middle part. I can hold down the shift key and double click, see how it adds it to the selection. I can also hit the control key and double click and it'll subtract it to, from the selection. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. Now at times, here's what we want to do. Maybe I, don't, uh, maybe I don't have three pieces, maybe I have like 800 pieces. And it'd be easier if I could just drag out a, a selection box to grab everything, kind of like what we do over in Photoshop, okay? You know, that, that functionality is built into Moto, but it's a little bit different, okay? Um, if you hold down the right mouse button and drag, you're either going to get a shape that looks like a rectangle or something weird that looks, it's called the lasso. It looks like this. Okay. Whatever's inside the shape will get selected. Now, personally, I find that really frustrating. It doesn't work for my brain. I'm a very simple guy. I like squares. Okay. If you want to change your selection shape, simply right-click in the background of your OpenGL viewport. You get this little popover. And down towards the bottom, there's a style called lasso selection or lasso style. Rectangle. I like rectangle. Explore the others. Find what works for you. One of the cool things about working inside of Moto is that there's really no wrong way to work with the interface. It's plastic. It wants to be molded. So make it work for you. Okay? There's almost 30 of us in this classroom. There are 30 different ways of managing this. Okay? Find, one, find a way that works for you. Yes, sir. So this is the problem with the initial selection type, right? We, we drag out a box. Because if you look very carefully with it. I'm, I'm glad I decided to rotate my piece before I messed up anything. Yeah. Yeah, only a portion gets selected, right? So actually, it's only, it's only selecting the surfaces that are facing the camera that the user can see, right? And that we're inside that box, OK? Yeah. So, huh, the surfaces that. Is there, hey, can, can you rotate it just to see what happens? Yeah. Well, I'll let you play with that on yourself. <laughs> However, there is a really nice extension to this. this uh, it's called a marquee selection. That's what, actually what we're doing when we drag out a box. If you want to do what's called select through and grab everything that's inside of that box, instead of firing off a right mouse button and dragging, watch what happens when you do a middle mouse button and drag out a box. There is a middle mouse button. Okay. Yeah, welcome to the world of 3D. We have to have a true three button mouse. Okay. Have to have it. You can't do this off a laptop. You can't do it off a trackpad. You have to have a three button mouse because in our world, that three button that third button has a role, a very big role. Okay. So the middle mouse button allows us to select through and grab everything. Okay. And now I have 100% of the shape. All right. So we've talked about how to select things and deselect things. What if we're just kind of, I don't know, done with this thing? And we want to delete it. We don't want a teapot in our scene. How do we remove geometry? Yeah. OK. Hit the delete key. Now, uh, so I just hit the backspace key. This goes away. However, Yeah, okay. So the backspace key is going to do what we're after. Okay? The backspace. Uh, either the backspace key or the delete key. It's going to be one and the same. So that's how easy it is for us to remove geometry from our scene. Just select it, boom, it's gone. Now, remember, remember a mantra whatever is selected will be edited, right? If nothing is selected, everything is edited. Okay? So if you, act, if you don't have a single thing selected and you accidentally hit the backspace key, what have you just done? You've deleted everything on that mesh, OK? So you got to be careful with this. Great power comes with great responsibility. It's up to you to manage your scenes, OK? Um, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Yeah, it'll do all of it if you want it to. Well, your camera is different. The camera is, a, is, is in a different container. All right. <clears throat> Other questions that kind of popped, popped up and, and bubbled to the surface. Yes, ma'am. Like 
all of this jazz? Yeah. Yeah, these are going to change what we see inside of our viewport. Yep. Actually, let me do this. Let me put my teapot back. Okay. And uh, check this out. This is actually kind of cool. We can determine how this object shows up in our viewport. We, yeah, go ahead. Command Z. Command Z is undo. You can also access that command from the edit pull down menu at the top of the screen, right there. Here on the Mac, if you're used to working on a PC, it'd be control Z, right? Here on the Mac, everything that was mapped to the control button has now been mapped to the command button. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we can change how the computer draws this environment. Okay, because this is a not this is not exactly um, this is not what the render is going to produce. This is just a representation of it, right? We can determine how the computer is drawing our scene based on a couple different properties. Specifically, and this is this is application wide inside of every viewport. You're gonna at the very least see these two buttons. Okay, this determines how uh, or, or excuse me, this determines uh, your view of your three dimensional scene. So right now I'm looking through the perspective view. However, I could easily go in and say, I just want to look at my scene from the top. Okay. And once I click on it, I didn't click on it. There we go. Now I'm just seeing my, my scene from the top. Okay. I could also go in, like maybe I want to see from the, like the left. There it is. This is called an orthographic view. This is still 3D geometry. We're just seeing it along a two-dimensional space versus a three-dimensional space. You can still pan and zoom like you would inside of our uh, inside of our perspective view of our scene. I can pan around, I can zoom, but what is the one thing I'm not allowed to do if you're following along? Orbit, yeah, rotate, okay? The only way to orbit and rotate around your scene is to go into the perspective view, okay? And now it's a true 3D scene. Now, why are those orthographic views really important? How do they help us inside the modeling pipeline, you think? Yeah, it helps us very quickly from that one perspective to understand the spatial relationships between multiple items, right? Now we can get a, a much more accurate read on the distance between certain elements within inside of our scene. They're incredibly useful and they allow us to work accurately, very accurately, extraordinarily accurate. It's wonderful, okay? Um, there's a quick, uh, a, little, a little quick pie menu that I like to use to zip around all these scenes. This is Pat's moto trick of the day. It's a good one, okay? I want to keep my, as a 3D modeler, I want to keep my attention and my mouse cursor on the area of interest. Let's say that I'm in here and I'm working on all these polygons. I want to stay right here. I want my attention on those selected polygons so I can, you know, do whatever it is that I'm trying to do. Okay. Oftentimes that flow, if you will, is broken if I now have to change views and take my cursor away from the area of interest and go way up here. I know it seems silly, but it is kind of far on these big computer screens, okay? And then change my view from this crazy list, okay? That kind of breaks my modeling rhythm and flow. So the, the guys and gals down at the foundry have done us a, a, a solid, and they've given us a really handy keyboard shortcut that will allow us to very quickly change our view. And it's control space bar. If you press and hold the control and space bar, you get this little popover. called a pie menu or marking menu depending on where you're coming from okay and now you can see these are all the views of my scene including the camera's viewpoint of the scene so I could simply you can either click on it if you want and it loads in the top view okay but you don't necessarily have to click on it if you do control space bar <coughs> notice that if I just simply put my cursor on the button and then let go it'll change the view for me Okay, and after a while, once you get used to it, you won't even think about it. Okay, like okay, I need to see the top. Boom. I need to see perspective. Boom, because those those buttons are in the exact same space inside of the pie menu. So you'll generate some muscle muscle memory. Yeah. What do you, what what top of what here? Oh, yeah, when you're holding down the control key. Yep, yep, that's fine. 
That's the, these, these are just different selection options, and there's actually some others in here too. Yeah, we'll get to those later. Um, I have a question about yeah. the, um, I don't know if you're going to cover this today or next week or whatever, but it bugs me and I'm kind of curious. So in the top left, you have the, all your primitives, your cube, your sphere, all that. When I try and click one of those, it creates a cube. It makes it a two-dimensional. You have to drag it out. Yeah. You got to drag it out. And, and so there's, that's not a setting somebody changed. That's just a nope. natural. It's we're going to come back to that in a minute. Actually, in, 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 in about 30 seconds, we're talking about making shapes. Okay, so we're going to come back to that here in a minute. Yeah, simple shapes. Uh, it's part of our lab today. It's going to be it's going to be fun. We're just going to make some shapes, make some circles, make some squares. Okay. Yes, sir. Last question with the hammer. Um, do you have to unmesh the hammer? What? The, 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 the left, the because I noticed like everything is unmesh. Yeah. Okay, if everything is, yeah, so my teapot here is a good example, okay? This is an item. We have many separate pieces inside of an item, okay? You were in item mode, so when you clicked on it and fired off the move tool, everything moved, right? Everything, everything moved, right? What we need to do is drill down into one of these component modes. Like I'm going to go into my polygons, okay? And now I can go in and just select certain portions of my mesh, certain shapes within inside the shape sorter. I can uh -huh. double click there, and now I can move just the spout. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's probably what's going on. Yeah. Here's another handy dandy keyboard shortcut. If you're going to, you're often going to be um, changing your selection sets. The space bar allows you to cycle through all of your selection sets. Okay. And you can actually see it in my viewport. See how I have the spout down here selected still? Okay. Someone said earlier, when I asked how to deselect something, just hit the space bar. You're not actually deselecting something when you hit the space bar. You're just changing what you're able to select. Okay. Now, I got those polygons on the spout selected. If I hit the space bar, now I'm back in vert mode. Okay. Space bar one more time. We're in edges. But watch what happens when I return to my polygonal selection set. Boom. It preserves the selection, okay? So you physically have to drop the selection by clicking in the back of the scene. Once you click on the back of the of your scene, then everything's dropped and deselected, okay? All right. <clears throat> so for this week for our homework, we have a, a pretty fun challenge that's out in front of us. As I mentioned before, what we are making is this really cool train. But oftentimes, as 3D modelers, we get kind of stuck because we see these wonderful pieces of imagery that's coming out of any number of portfolio sites. You look online, you go on YouTube, you see these wonderful 3D models, right? And you go, how in the world did they get there? Okay, because last time I checked, there's not a make me a train button inside of Moda. Okay, there's, you know, we have to make everything by hand. And nine times out of ten, this is the finished result. Okay. Um, this is the finished model with all of its detail in there, but where do we begin as 3D modelers, right? It yeah, it hurts, right? Yeah, there's, there's a lot that, that's going on, right? These models, modeling is not about making one thing. It's about making 900 things that all work together to make the illusion of a train, okay? Yeah. So where do we begin? How do we model an airplane or the Millennium Falcon or a really cool unseen character from a film, right? Where's the natural starting point for our modeling process, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the natural starting point for our modeling process is going to be a shape deconstruction. Okay? Every complex shape has simple shapes at its core, at its root. It's kind of a, its DNA is something that's remarkably simple. Okay? So if we take a step back and look at our train here, Let's just, just do some basic shape analysis. What do you see? What simple shapes do you see? Someone said it? Cylinders, circles, right? What else do you see? Some squares, right? You know, if you look about, if you, if you really think about it, you know, these little pusher arms here, these are just really fancy squares. They're long rectangles, right? The fuselage, the boiler for the train itself, that's one cylinder. The house for the train on the back, that's just a really fancy square. Most things in life start off as squares, Cylinders and spheres, okay? Yeah. 
So it's our job to start kind of gaining the vision, the sight, if you will, into the world of simple shapes, okay? The first thing that we have to do as 3D modelers is understand the totality of the object that we're creating. It's not about the details. We'll get to the details later. This is going to be the end result of this train project here in a couple weeks because you're going to get to this soon, okay? But this isn't where we're going to start first, okay? How in the world can I model all of the crazy bolts for whatever this thing is? Okay, I really don't know what that is. Okay, how can I model that without understanding how big that little tan piece is in relationship to the total train size? Right. In every sense, just like we do in a classic art class, we have to paint with a broad brushstroke first. We have to block out the entire shape with simple forms before we then can start drilling down and modeling the details. Okay just like a traditional sculptor would. Have you guys ever taken a sculpture, a sculpture class? I really recommend it. If you're into 3D modeling, go run over to the art building and take a sculpture class. I don't care which one, we have a couple. Okay, Go take a sculpture and you'll find that they're going to be doing the exact same thing. They have a gigantic lump of clay, boom, right? They put it down on their table and then they start carving away the, you know, the big lump of clay into something that generally resembles the object that they're sculpting. And then once they're happy with it, they look at it from a number of different sides, and sometimes they even go crazy, and they put it in different lighting to see what the overall shape is. Then they'll start pushing in the detail and start you know, pulling out these shapes so that it becomes a little bit more realistic. Okay? Now, with this said, how is this a big benefit for us in, in our world? Because you know, the, you know, the, the natural starting place for a lot of folks is, I'm going to put a zillion polygons down, right? And this is going to be polygons, polygons, polygons. This is going to be so detailed. <laughs> Pixar, here I come, right? That's where we end. Why is that not the place we want to begin? Start small. I like it. Start simple. We already have some simple shape tools. That will help us out. Exactly, exactly. We are far more likely to make a change when the thing that we're changing is simple, right? If I have to make a change on a mesh that's got like 20 million polygons, the likelihood of me being willing to do that is zero. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to have to make this change. It's just, it's going to be too hard. Is, is it really worth it, right? And the director may say, yeah, it's really worth it. And then I go, oh, I don't want to do that. And then it turns into a thing. But if it's real simple, we can have a conversation about it, right? You know, then we all can say, is this it? Is this generally what we're after? We'll have to pretend. You know, we'll have to project a little bit. This is an art class. We're allowed to pretend in here, by the way. It's your amongst friends. Okay? Um, and then we can start, once we start you know, pretending and projecting and kind of seeing it in a simple shape, then we'll advance on to something that's more complex. Okay? So as an example, here's this exact same train exact same train, almost the exact same angle in its most simple primitive pieces. Okay? This is where we begin, because now we can understand the role of proportion. What's proportion? I like it. The ratio, the size of things, right? How? Yeah, that's a good answer. It's a fantastic answer, right? Now we can figure out, it's like, how big, how thick do these wheels need to be? I can draw a circle in two dimensions pretty quickly, but how thick are they going to be? And is that thickness proportional to the size of the boiler or to the size of the house, right? Remember, we're not making a train. We're making a boiler, you know, this thing, these arms, these wheels, all of these train pieces. There's a lot that is not just one model. It's 800 models that we're making. And we need to make sure that the relationship and size between all these pieces is correct, or as close as we can make it. So would the best way to tackle this first is not worry about how wide or how long, well, long road, but not like how wide the train is, as trying to worry about how wide relative the piece? That's a, that's a good place to begin. And sometimes when we look at our reference, which we'll see here in a second, you'll get some additional kind of helper clues that will kind of key you into how big and how small things need to be. Cylinders are a great great place to start and you'll see that in action when we start looking at our backdrop item okay so we'll come back to it um
at this level of detail, we can make changes quickly. It allows us to understand the total volume that we're participating in, right? Because we're making sculpture that's going to dominate and, and create a positive volume instead of a negative space, okay? Well, how big is that volume? And what's the proportion and the scale of each one of those objects in relationship to each other, right? Even though we're making a whole bunch of individual pieces, those individual pieces have a series of direct relationships with one another to create the illusion of a train, okay? Every 3D model begins with a simple shape. I always love, I'm a, B, I'm a big Star Wars nerd. Actually, I'm a Star Wars mega nerd, right? Uh, Star Wars in every sense is my beginning. Truly, it is my beginning. I'll be honest with you, and this is amongst kindred spirits in this class, uh, I had, uh, my aspirations in life was not to be a 3D modeler, right? My aspiration in life, my actual goal when I was 10 years old was not to be a Jedi, but maybe a Jedi in its own sense. But my actual goal when I was 10 years old was to work at the model shop at ILM. I wanted to be a kit modeler. I wanted to build the plastic models that they filmed, right? And I spent a majority of my childhood with paint and glue on my hands because I made every kit model that I could possibly find, right? That was my passion as it still is today. And then right about high school, uh, my father, who was a pretty progressive guy at the time, uh, we ha he bought a computer for my brother and I to use, which was pretty rad. And at some point, he handed me the first copy of Lightwave 3D, which was one of the early, early, early 3D modeling applications. And he says, hey, I know you're making models. You might want to check this out. It's on the computer. And I want, what's this all about? And I very quickly discovered that I can do the exact same thing I was doing in my bedroom with glue and paint on my hand digitally on the computer. And I was addicted at that point, right? Because I don't know if you guys have ever done Have you ever glued your fingers together? Uh, I have a number of times, right? So I was pretty happy at, you know, at 11 or 12 of, of the idea of, of making a model where, you know, I didn't have to glue my fingers together. Because how is the only way that you can glue, unglue your fingers together? You gotta rip those bad boys apart. You can have, you can soak them a little bit in the water, but eventually it's gonna be a band-aid moment where you're like, okay, here we go. Ah! It takes a couple of skin layers off, right? Anyways, okay. Um, so for us in the modeling business, it doesn't matter if we're, we're doing it digitally or if we're doing it practically with kit models. Our sequence is exactly the same. Okay. Um, let me show you what we're going towards because I think having these still images is a good place to begin. Okay. But we actually need to see some geometry. Okay. And I'm not doing this to show off. This is just how I work. Okay. Oops. That was a weird bug. Now let's do this. You open up the project file. <coughs> All right. So earlier, we've been looking at some simple shapes. I thought this might be a good time to see what an actual piece of geometry looks like. Okay. Um, you know, it, you know, down at Pixar and ILM, they make this stuff look easy, but it's actually not. Um, you know, this is the level of detail that we're going to get to. Like I said, it's not just one thing. Many, 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 many things. Okay. Individual pieces. Okay. Yeah. So it's not just one piece, it's a lot of different pieces. Okay. I'm going to turn off my, um, my verts. Yeah, and this is what it looks like, honestly. This is what it looks like. Uh huh. Like looking at all those panels, it's like, wow, that looks hard. But then I realized, oh, you literally just selected like 12 of them and then moved the Z frame in just a tiny little bit and then kind of to get that insect look. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's pretty simple. And then I realized you did that about a thousand times. And I go, yeah, now it's hard again. Yeah. Yep. You know, there's a lot of detail that goes into these models. Okay. A lot of details. Okay. Uh, they can get quite complex. But we always want to start with simple, meager beginnings. Okay. And those, for us, inside of Moto, those simple, meager, meager beginnings are our simple shape tools. Okay? We have to figure out what this thing looks like in 3D with its most simple forms first before we can start drilling down and making all these crazy high resolution details. Okay? The big mistake that people make um, is trying to, trying to make something super complex first. 
I was talking about Star Wars earlier, and one of the cool things about Star Wars history is the creation of the Millennium Falcon, right? Uh, the Millennium Falcon actually was created by two different individuals. The first Millennium Falcon looks nothing like the Falcon that we have today. Has, has anyone seen the original artwork for the Millennium Falcon? They actually made a model of it as well. Yeah, what does it look like? Yeah, it looks just like a long cylinder with some landing gears on it and kind of a cool cockpit. That's it. That was the Millennium Falcon. And George Lucas, he actually, you know, he bought the concept work. He actually hired and commissioned a model maker to make the model. And then, as it often goes, once you see something in front of you in real lighting, in a real situation, and you go, huh, is this it? Nine times out of ten, you have a direct emotional reaction to what you see in, in reality. Okay? And George Lucas went, uh, this is not cool. <laughs> this is not cool at all. And uh, he commissioned another concept artist to come up with the design for the Millennium Falcon. And I love this little bit of cinema history. What was the genesis moment, the simple shape that started the Millennium Falcon? Does anyone know this? Huh? Well, I, I honestly couldn't hear you. It's very close. It's not. In all honesty, the, the simple shape that, that created the idea was a hamburger with a pickle hanging out the side. Yeah, seriously. Seriously. Y'all laughed when I said cheese wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about it, if you deconstruct the form of a Millennium Falcon, you can see it, right? It's a big kind of a, you know, oval with a ham with a pickle hanging out the side for the cockpit. That was the Genesis idea. That was the simple form that started the artist down the, the process of creating a more detailed high resolution object, right? We're going we're gonna to do literally the exact same thing. We're not going to do a hamburger with a pickle hanging out the side, but we do need to start breaking down and understanding at the core how to make these simple shapes. Okay? Uh, it was explored earlier that making simple shapes in Moto is different than what a lot of people think it's going to be. I'm going to close my train model and go back to my teapot. And actually, I don't need my teapot. Oops. There we go. I don't need my teapot anymore. So let's get to work here. Okay. Um, how do I delete all these polygons? Backspace, yeah. Don't have anything selected. Hit the backspace key. Everything is going to be gone. All right. Um, now that we're going to start working with simple shapes, we need to have kind of an understanding of how our scene works. Last week we talked very briefly about the idea of rotating and orbiting around our scene. And the metaphor that I draw, I drew upon was the idea that we're like an astronaut in a jet pack. You guys remember that part? Were you asleep by then? Because last week there was a lot of syllabus stuff, right? Uh, we're like a jet. We're an astronaut with a jet pack on, right? And we're tooling around the outside of the International Space Station. The space station isn't moving. We, as the astronaut, are moving around it. Okay? There are some landmarks that will help us keep our bearings. Because think about it. In space, do you guys ever see the movie Gravity yep. with Sandra Bullock? Wonderful yeah. film. Wonderful film. I loved it personally. All right? And I'm a, I'm a big Sandra Bullock fan, so I think she did a fantastic job. And you know, the biggest fear of probably anyone who goes to space was realized in that film where you're tumbling out of control into empty space. Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so in space, think about it. In space where there is no horizon line, how can you tell mission control back in Houston which way is up and down? How can we have a meaningful communication as to how we are oriented inside of our three-dimensional space when there is no reference point in that space to help people understand? Well, think about it. You're in space, right? You're tumbling. Maybe you are you know, what we would call upside down, right? In space, there's zero gravity, there's no horizon line. You don't feel the effects of gravity at all, right? So maybe we are upside down in space, right? But to the astronaut's perspective, they're not upside down, okay? We have a, a local understanding of up, down, left, and right, but that becomes arbitrary when we're in an environment that has no reference points, right? We work inside of that exact same conundrum here in 3D. We don't have any reference points. I can easily orbit and tumble my shapes uh, or tumble myself upside down uh, and, and be in, you know, have a problem, right? Someone had a comment. I want to make sure that comment or question is, is answered. So how do we work? 
I'm actually, let me put my teapot back just so we have something in here, right? How do we work? How do we understand up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, instead of a three-dimensional space? Really important ideas now that we're going to start building some shapes. The axes. The axes. X, Y, Z. You got it. Remember, we are working in a 3D modeling application. There are three dimensions that we are modeling within. Three orientations, three planes of existence, if you will. Okay. Now, if you go again all the way back to 10th grade geometry, you're used to pointing, or excuse me, you're used to building uh, and plotting points. Along, and you're going to love this, or maybe hate this, depending on geometry for you, right? You're used to plotting points along a 2D. Cortesian grid, right? You guys remember that Cortesian grid? The thing that everyone loved to hate, right? Because geometry class is when you could usually figure out the solution to the problem, but then they, they forced you to show your work, right? And then it's like, oh, okay, now I gotta remember all these theories and laws and all that jazz, right? But a, cor a 2D Cortesian grid looks like this, right? It's this thing. And we have these big ruler markers on the grid, something like this. Now, this is, uh, this is what we're used to seeing, okay? Plotting points. Uh, so we have often put like a dot, like right here, and then your teacher would be like, okay, tell me the location of that dot. Now, what is the location of that dot? How do we do it? Two, two. Two, two. How do we know that? Yeah. Show your work. Look at X and y. Okay, good. So we have two axes, right? We have the X axis over here, and the X axis does what? Which way within our grid here does the x-axis kind of define? Left and right. So it does the horizontal. This is the x-axis here. It does left to right. Its inverse, naturally, is the y-axis, which does what? The vertical. Good. We're listening. This is the vertical axis. Okay. So to find the location of that dot, we count one, two. That's where it is on this plane, right? And then we count up. 1, 2, and this is where that dot is on this plane. The x values always come first, the y values come second. So the location of that dot is in fact 2, 2. Okay. Now at the intersection of these grids, we have a very important landmark. Does anyone remember what that thing is called? Origin. This is the origin, right? This is the center of the universe, the origin. Think of this like uh, the sun center of our solar system. Everything works around the solar system. Okay? Everything rotates around our sun. It is the dead center. Now, the origin is also really important for us in the 3D sense because it is the common denominator between every application out there. In every app, there's going to be a center point. There's going to be an absolute kind of home position. Everything understands the role of the origin. Now, what is the location numerically of the origin? Zero, you got it. So instead of two, two, our origin is zero, zero. Now, if I was plotting a point over here, okay, let's do it right here. There's my new point. Where's that one? Yeah, so point being is that we have two different sides of one axis. We have positive values along the x, one, two, and three. But then on the opposite side of the origin, those values are flipped. So now we have negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. Same goes for the y-axis. These are the positive side. And on the bottom, this is the negative side of the y-axis. Okay? You'll see why I'm talking about geometry here in a, in a big minute. Okay? Because uh, it all relates directly to how we're working in 3D. Now, if you were to describe uh, this crazy idea of the x and the y axis to an alien that's just popped up on our planet, right? And I'm, beam me up, Scotty, I'm ready to go, right? Is anyone else ready for aliens? I'm ready to go. Like, let's do this, okay? Like, I, I, like, I tell my wife all the time, like, I would love to be abducted. Like, I would love nothing more to get abducted. I, I see, and that's it. They have telepathic abilities like, nope, he's out. <laughs> he's going to tell on us if we get him, right? <laughs> Anyways, so if an alien walks out, right, and says, I don't understand this whole X and Y thing, how are we going to describe it to them? <laughs> well, okay. We could draw a picture, but let's pretend we don't have anything to draw it on. 
Let's use our words. Let's use our words. How are you going to describe the role of the x and the y axis? Make it too complex. Yeah, make it too complex. Okay. Bingo, there it is, up and down, left and right. You got it, up and down, left and right. All right, that's the simple explanation. The x-axis is always going to describe left and right. The y-axis is always going to describe up and down. But in the sense of 3D modeling, what's that third one? The third axis. Z. Now, what, is the, what in the world is the z-axis responsible for doing? Not diagonals. OK. Depth. So if x is left and right, y is up and down, z is forwards and backwards, OK? x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, OK? Forwards and backwards. We're still doing the exact same type of math. We're still plotting points along a grid. We're just doing it along a different dimension now, OK? Three axes. Now, those three axes are replicated quite wonderfully inside the computer. We take advantage of this. In 3D modeling, we are effectively plotting points on a Cartesian grid exactly like this. This is not magic, folks. It's all math, OK? Let's return to Moto for a second. And I have my grid on, and you can start to see this idea on the surface of our grid, literally on the surface of our grid. Okay? It's really easy to see it if we flip over into an orthographic view where we can get a good understanding of this grid itself. Now I'm looking at my scene from the top so in every sense the only parts of the here's the X going from left to right, you get little labels on it. Now we don't see, the only part of our, of our scene that we see are the X and the Z at the moment that says negative Z over there. Okay? Yeah. Yep, there's tiny little letters. And inside the perspective view, they're way out over here at the edges. They are there, little badges that tell you where you are inside of your three-dimensional scene. Now, at times, those little badges can be difficult to see because they're dark gray on top of a dark gray environment. So the guys and gals down at the foundry have done us this solid. They've given us a compass to help us keep our bearings so that we can tell Mission Control where we are and how, how we've tumbled inside of the three-dimensional scene because there always needs to be a reference point, okay? How can we work if there we have no kind of common reference point between every conversation? Okay? That compass gives us the reference points, and this is our compass, our 3D compass. Okay? You're going to see this in a lot of different 3D applications. This is kind of as close to an industry standard idea as we possibly can get. Okay? Uh, we, we are absolutely like the clothing industry. We have standardized sizes, but everyone ignores them. Right? Does it drive anyone else crazy? Yeah. It drives me. I mean, it just. It, really drives me nuts. I go into one store and I'm one waist size, right? And then I go into another store, have the exact same fit on a pair of jeans, and I'm a completely different waist size. It drives me crazy. Why do we even have rulers if, if this is how we're going to do Yeah, but that doesn't make sense to me though, right? We have a ruler. That ruler should be the same in every single region. Anyways, okay. Um, so this compass is going to keep us all on the same page, okay? In my imagination, this compass really had, is really our arrows, okay? You see these lines down here? These are arrows, okay, in my imagination. What are they pointing towards? What does downwards mean, though, if we're flipped upside down? It's in the abstract now. Okay, so we're, we're definitely, this is where the z-axis is located. But what is this arrow pointing towards along the z-axis? The positive side of the z-axis, OK? The positive sides are where these arrows are pointing, right? Now, the posit in, the three in the sense of 3D modeling, these positive values have some meaning associated with them, OK? Specifically, the y-axis and the z-axis. If we can get two out of the three, the third one can be assumed, OK? Now, let's pretend that we're on week 15 and we are making a 3D model of a character. Now, you're going to model your characters like this. This is called the T-pose, okay? We always model our characters at, at their extreme position. It's a whole lot easier to model someone like this opposed to, like, a football player. You know, it'd be difficult to model a football player looking like that, right? This is easy, and then we can deform it and rig it into this pose at the end of the day. 
So we model our characters like this. Which direction should our head be facing? How would you, in, in our world right now, which direction, if you were to put a stake in my head, which direction would that, that arrow be pointing? Up. My head's facing up, right? It'd be on the y-axis. You got it. So we always, up, up is positive y. Up is positive y, okay? Now, which direction inside of our three-dimensional scene should the, our nose be facing? Positive z, right? So the positive side of the y-axis equals up. Okay. Bingo. You got it. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So I'll put it below the chalkboard so you all can see it. So y positive equals up. Z positive. That's not. I did the plus sign, the equal sign, the exact same time. Z positive equals the front of our scene. Okay, the front of our scene. Does that make sense? We always want naturally the features of our models to be facing certain directions. And these are the defined directions inside of our scene. Y, y positive is up, Z positive is the front of the scene. Your, your train this week needs to be built and created along so that the front of the train is facing the front of our scene. Makes sense, right? Okay. We want the smokestacks of our train to be facing up. So which direction should the smokestacks be facing? Y positive. You got it. Positive Y. Okay. So there is a purpose for this. And there's a very direct relationship with the orientation of our XYZ axes in determining how we model our stuff. Okay. Now at times, uh, working inside of Moto can be, or any 3D package for that matter, can be a little confusing. Okay. Because we could be working, we could be working, going to town, and then all of a sudden things are upside down, right? Hmm. However, even though I've tumbled around my scene with my little astronaut jetpack on, the compass is always, 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 always telling me the current orientation of my scene. The compass is, is, is always going to be your guide. Now I know that in this particular, in this particular orientation, I've, I've flipped over. My view of the universe is flipped over. Screen space, Y is down, OK? The compass is going to help us keep track of these things, OK? In addition, the developers down at the Foundry have, have done something that I think is really helpful. There's another subtle cue in the background of our scene that very directly reminds us which way's up and which way's down. What's that subtle little cue? The gradient. The gradient, absolutely. Good, good, good job. That gray gradient allows us to visually understand our bearings, OK? Uh, so in every sense, the darkness is what? The dark part of the gradient? I'll zoom out. Dark part of the gradient is the ground, OK? See, it's dark down here. This is the ground. This is down, y negative. And the light part, part of the gradient, this is the sky. This is y positive, OK? So if, you, so if you find yourself building something, uh, like if you're building your train and the smokestacks are all facing the ground, are all facing the dark part of your scene, you're in trouble. Okay? You're in trouble. We need to start rotating and flipping them so they're oriented up and down. Makes sense? Starting to feel it a little bit? Comfortable, getting more and more comfortable with how this whole crazy system works? Because it is a crazy system, it really is. But you'll get some experience with it, and you'll start to feel more comfortable shortly. Trackball rotation, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so I've, there's a, oops, I clicked off it. There's a master switch that will allow us to enable and disable trackball rotation. Let me re-enable that master switch so I can show you specifically what that looks like, okay? Um, I turn mine off because I really, really, really hate it. And, oh gosh, remapping, there we go. Okay. 
So trackball, trackball rotation, let's talk about it. Um, some folks have it on, some folks have it off. This is something that at the very least you, you should be made of, uh, aware of, okay? If you've been working inside the scene and it's just kind of, I don't know, not orbiting in a natural way, that's because we have trackball rotation on, okay? Believe it or not, and I heard someone say, what, do people even use trackballs? Yeah. In a big way, trackballs are really popular. They're very popular, actually. Why are trackballs so much more? Uh, why are trackballs still around? Because it seems like a, a you know a hangover from the '80s. Some people with disabilities. People with disabilities, absolutely a big, big part of it for sure. Precision. Precision. You get a lot more, a lot more kind of attenuation with a trackball than you can with a mouse. Okay. Some industries require trackball rotation. Rotation. Some CAD tools. Their entire architecture is built around that rotation paradigm, okay? And then, you know, for us old folks, it's ergonomic. Carpal tunnel is a real thing, it really is. And trackball rotation, using a trackball, moving your mouse with your thumb, ergonomically is far superior than doing this with your wrist, okay? Yeah, like I have a trackball at home, and I love it. Logitech just released a new trackball, like last week, and I'm like, I'm going to get that, because I think it's awesome, right? So there is a reason for it. Trackballs still exist, and they're still around. Um, on that note, think about ergonomics. Uh, take care of your wrists, please, okay? Seriously, take care of your wrists. This is your money maker in the 3D business. The moment this goes out, you're done, okay? Seriously, I know people that have ended their careers because they've been sitting in front of a computer for 12 hours a day doing this all day long, okay? You get the carpal tunnel surgery, you can't do that for more than a couple hours. Your career is over because no studio is gonna hire someone that can only work for a couple hours. Some people have that magic. I don't have that kind of kung fu in my back pocket. I'm not ambidextrous like that. Um, so if you want to turn it off, and for most people, it's more comfortable to disable it. Okay, and um, the you know imagine if you will that there's a gigantic sphere on your screen, a ball. Okay, and the way the trackball rotation works is if you're you know kind of pushing the sphere this way, it makes sense. Okay. Now, if I start my rotation down in the center of that big invisible sphere, that makes sense. Where it becomes wicked powerful is when we do it in the corners. Because remember, there's an invisible sphere that's tumbling our scene. Uh, and doing you know, this type of rotation, you know, kind of doing it like that, that can be tricky in some situations. Some people love it. Okay? I don't, okay? so I turn it off. Simply hitting the O key will bring, up, bring open your viewport properties, and you can turn it off down here. It's either on default is basically a fancy word for on, <laughs> and then we want it to be off. And now, for most people, this feels a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable. Okay? All right. Other questions before we kind of move on a little bit? Yeah, it's in the center. Where the, the place that we orbit around is in the center of the screen. Yeah. Whereas with the trackball spread, you press down on your mouse or... Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. I don't know exactly how it works. I just know how Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for the question, whoever asked it. Yeah. That's a good question. All right. Before we jump off on our break, let's just take a couple seconds here. And uh, let's start playing around and making some simple shapes. Since we talked earlier about the importance of these simple shapes in our 3D modeling pipeline, um, let's talk about how we can create simple shapes easily inside of Moto. And th there's a very easy system, but it is a little different, admittedly, especially if you're coming, excuse me, especially if you're coming from a 2D illustration or like a Photoshop background. How we work with our simple shapes is inspired. Admittedly, it is different though. So these are all of our basic shape creation tools, all of these guys. And we can create a whole bunch of them, squares, donuts. Uh, this is the tube tool. We can create something. We can create uh, custom surfaces with the pen tool. This is the text tool. Uh, but all of them have a similar kind of workflow. Okay. Now that we're working with creation tools, it's important that we talk about the system that we have to go through or the sequence that we have to go through to work with these tools correctly. 
much like you do when you uh, like come to school, if you have a car, when you jump in your car, safety first, seatbelt on, right? Okay, and when you're ready to go, what's the first thing you do? Turn the key. No, seriously, you turn your car on, right? You put the key in the ignition, crank it, and you're on your way. You gotta turn the car on. We gotta do the exact same thing. We gotta enable our tools first, okay? Also, like driving a car, once you get to school, you get out of your car, or well, you turn off your car, right? You, you use the car. You turn on the car, you use your car, you turn off your car, right? Uh, we have to do the exact same thing with our tools. We turn on our tool just by clicking on it. We know that it's on and active because the orange background, okay? It, it does. It says it over by the compass. There's a couple other places that it tells you that there's a tool on. Down below, we have tool properties that are showing up in this part of the interface, okay? So we get a lot of feedback that we are, in fact, using a tool. Now, for this particular tool, we have to left-click and drag inside of the viewport to create our shape. So I just left-click and drag out a rectangle. Now, this tool is still on. Even though, clearly, I have moused up and I've walked away from the keyboard, this tool is still active. Okay? This isn't like Photoshop where at the moment you mouse up, the tool is over. Okay? Our tools stay on because there's a number of properties that we have to enable either over here in the properties panel or interactively in the viewport. Okay? There's a couple things that we still need to do. Now, if you look carefully inside of Moto, they've given us these wonderful widgets around the boundary of our cube that will allow us to interactively change the size of that cube while the tool is still on. Okay? See? So I can reshape my cube while the tool is still active. While the car is on, I can drive it around the block again if I like. Okay? Now the question earlier was, I can make a two-dimensional cube very quickly. It's just a two-dimensional square. In the center, there's another little, another little box. Depending on your orientation inside the scene, the color of that box could be, well, it could be red, green, or blue. Okay? If we pull that little cube out, we can transform it into a true three-dimensional shape. Okay? Yeah, well, for a cube, the wireframes are there. They're just really faint. At the edges, there's a wireframe. Okay? Now, before we go any further, this is kind of an important part of our sequence. Okay? I've activated the tool. I've used the tool. Now I'm done with the tool and I'm ready to move on. Okay? I'm ready to come to class. So like your car, I gotta turn it off. Okay? Now this is gonna take some discipline. This is a big kind of it's a big architecture and a big system in, in which we create and use our tools inside of Moto. We have to deactivate this tool. Okay? We have to physically turn it off. Some tools will continue to influence the rest of our scene if we don't deactivate them, right? So in Moto, there's really a couple different ways that we can deactivate a tool and stop it influencing the rest of our scene. Now, how do, has anyone stumbled upon one of those ways to deactivate a tool? Patrick, what you got? The Q key. The Q key, absolutely. Q key will turn a tool off. <coughs> Boom. Now, visually, with inside of the interface, how do I know that that tool is, in fact, off? Nothing's orange, so the background color of the tool icon is not orange anymore, okay? We no longer see the tool handles inside of our three-dimensional scene, the second cue, okay? The third clue that things are that off, all those tool properties over here are gone, okay? So we get a lot of visual reinforcement that this is, in fact, off. So the Q key is an excellent way to turn off a, a tool. And in all honesty, you're not actually turning off the tool. You're just activating another tool. It's called the selection tool, whose keyboard shortcut is the Q key. Now, another easy way to turn off the influence of a tool is by doing what's called dropping the tool. And you'll hear this in the Motorverse. If you go out there and look at videos, a lot of people will say, you just drop the tool. That's a fancy way of saying turn it off. Okay? An easy way of turning off a tool, tap the space bar tool goes off. Okay? So the Q key is a way to turn a tool off. The space bar will turn a tool off. 
And last but least, and so obvious, but some people miss it, you just return to the icon, click on the icon, and you can turn the tool off. Okay? And now that's, that tool is no longer influencing our scene. Okay? Let's make another one. Let's make a sphere. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. Uh, how would you, and they're all in the same mesh. Uh huh. How would you uh, then re go back into it and edit? So, good question. Good question. So, what you're trying to do is called an extrusion or a bevel, right? That transforms a two dimensional shape into a three dimensional shape. For sure. Yep. You can find both the extrude tool and the bevel tool over in this part of your interface. We're not going to go into too much detail on that today, but we'll get into that edit stage much later on. Next so week, I think, actually. So I, uh, way back in high school, I used Inventor from Autodesk. Uh-huh. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of, there's obviously massive differences, but um, I noticed in here, once you define, oh, I want a one meter by two meter square, mm -hmm. you cannot change it from one meter to 1.5 meters. All you have <laughs> is a scale percentage on the X axis. Bingo. Is there any way to change no. that due to numerical, or is it just? And this is a big difference between how Moto handles its shape creation system in comparison to others. When you're using a program like Inventor or 360 or SolidWorks for that matter, that is a parametric modeling program that has object history. So it remembers all the dimensions of all the objects at all times, right? Because its function is to create something for the manufacturing industry. This is an art program. <laughs> you know, even though we can do a tremendous amount of CAD level work in here and we can we have a real world unit of measurement that is incredibly accurate and fantastic, we don't have that object level history. So once we drop the tool, we lose the functionality to numerically change its shape. Yeah. There are other ways to get to that to get those numbers though. It's just it's just different. So if We're going to adjust your thinking process a little bit, okay? Remember, this is an art program. There's a reason why, you know, the CAD designers sit over there and we sit over here, okay? So we have to just kind of adjust our, our way of thinking ever so slightly, okay? Um, I'm going to free your mind. I'm like Morpheus from The Matrix, right? This is great, right? I just, it just dawned on me now that, you know, this is... It's my 11th year of teaching. I'm no longer Neo from The Matrix, and I have graduated into Morpheus, which is both happy and sad for me at the exact same time. Anyways. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, I, you know, everyone just kind of explore this for a little bit. Just take five minutes. Play around with these shape creation tools, okay? There are, are some really fun ones in here. I made a sphere. You know, this next one over here is a cylinder. They all follow the exact same construction uh, sequence. You click on it. And then you just drag out a shape, okay? And then they'll have little widgets on the outside that will allow you to adjust the shape. And then there's almost always going to be one on the inside which will allow you to extrude it out and transform it into a three-dimensional shape. Once we drop the tool, however, and the cylinder is a really great example of this, right? I can change the dimensions of, of, my, of my circle while the tool is still active. But once I drop the tool, okay, I'm never going to get those widgets back. I'm never going to be able to transform it from an oval to a sphere easily, okay? <clears throat> of course, there's the famous cone here. So you can just make just about anything. There's the donut tool. Who doesn't love a good donut? There's donuts. <laughs> Maybe you're a bagel person. So just explore these for a second. Yeah, Brianna. OK, what's up? Oh, yeah, her items just don't even appear. OK. Um, so I, I, I'm like, I was assuming she's too far out, but it's not that. Yeah, let's see. All right, so I want to show you something. This is, this is going to be a common kind of recurring problem inside of our classroom, OK? I want you to look very carefully in my, and I know I just asked you to go play with the shapes, but if I can have your attention, that'd be great. So I'm looking at my, my scene from the top, and 
naturally, very easily, I can see the grid behind it, right? From the orthographic views, top, left, right, bottom, front, all that, all that jazz, you can see the grid, okay? The grid squares in the background. Now, Moto has a dynamic grid. If you look at the grid, it never actually changes its size, but Moto's understanding of how big those squares are is going to dynamically change, and that happens at this value down here. Okay? Right now, based on how close I am to this object, each one of these grid squares is 200 millimeters in size. Okay? If I was to zoom out, the size of those grid squares really isn't going to change all that much, but that number is going to change. See how the size of the squares kind of stay the same? Now, each one of those squares is how big? 50 meters. 50 meters, okay? So 50, 100 meters, 150, so on and so forth. Brianna, how, how big are each one of your grid squares on yours? 50 kilometers, okay? 50 kilometers. So she is way zoomed out. She's in, she is light years away from the origin of her scene which is probably why she's not finding her stuff. Does anyone remember the really cool keyboard shortcuts that will get us back to the origin? A. a. The A key is going to auto fit the contents of your scene. I said the A key as well. And now we're back. Good. I did a test. This is a couple years ago. Someone asked me, it's like, is, how big is the Moto environment, right? And I said, well, in theory, it's, it's infinite, right? It's kind of like the galaxy or the universe, excuse me. And, and, then, and then the next question, it's like, is it really infinite? And I went, I don't know. Let's, let's test it out. <laughs> so I made a, I went on to NASA.gov or, or somewhere. I don't remember where now. And uh, I found out all the dimensions of all the planets in our solar system. And I made a scale model of our solar system in about 10 minutes, right? Uh, and lo and behold, Moto did it. It was a high heartbeat. It just kept on chugging away. So our, our you know, Moto will actually let you go to Pluto. Okay, <laughs> inside of the three-dimensional scene, it, it will allow you to do it if you, if you wanted to. I think it repeats you up front when, uh, when the number reaches 264 power, is that 64 to this operation? It probably would. That's a, very good, that's a very good observation. You're probably right. All right, I tell you what. I've been going for almost two hours. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a small little break. Get up, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, and then continue playing around with these simple little shapes. Then after our break, we'll talk about uh, how we can continue flushing out our little train. Back by three.
Okay, so hopefully everyone's had a really great opportunity to play around with the shape creation tools. As I mentioned earlier, this is going to be kind of like our bread and butter. We're going to be doing this all the time. 3D modeling at its core is fundamentally about making simple shapes, okay? So our shape tools do a good job of getting us going, right? But there are some quirks, and some folks in here are probably starting to wonder uh, how these shapes were created or why they were created in certain orientations. And let me show you specifically what I'm talking about here. I'm going to get rid of everything in my scene, and I'm going to make a cone. Now, why in the world was my cone, was the tip of my cone created along the x-axis? It's a good question, right? If I was to drop the tool and make another cone, see, I want one over here. How come this time the tip of the cone is being made along the y-axis? This is random. It's just going wherever it wants, right? No. Actually, it's not going wherever it wants. And there's a very important architecture inside of Moto that's determining the orientation of the objects at creation. And this is kind of one of the tickets to get Moto, or one of the reasons to get Moto. It's a, this is, a, this is an e-ticket ride. I wish every app had the work plane, as it's called. The work plane is a snapping grid. And I've turned mine off because I, I don't really like to see it. But let me turn it on. OK. Now, the work plane. And I'm going to turn off the background gradient exclusively to, to make it easier to see this little work plane. You can do that by going into Drawing, drawing and Control. And under the GL Background option, I'm going to change it to None. It makes it a little bit easier to see some of these UI elements. Now, if you look very, very carefully, there is a light gray kind of ghosted grid in the background of my scene. What we are seeing here, it's this thing, OK? What we are, in fact, seeing is the work plane. The work plane is an interactive snapping grid that all of our tools use as a reference point, OK? And it's pretty neat. Let me show you how it works. The work plane changes its orientation based off of our view of the three-dimensional scene. Remember, we're an astronaut in the jetpack, so our orientation of the scene will change how the work plane is going to be manipulated. Now, check it out. I know it's hard. I hope that you see it on your screen, but it will change its orientation. So if I orbit down some, check it out. I'm going to orbit, 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 and right about there, see it's changing its orientation. It's flipping its, its position. And also orbit this way, and then right about now, it's going to change. It's going to flip its orientation by 90 degrees. Another really great way to see and understand the orientation of the work plane is by looking down at the compass. That little light gray or that little you know, semi-transparent cube, that's the work plane. Okay? Our shapes are always, by definition, by rule, going to be created on the work plane. Okay? So we need to be mindful of its orientation inside the three-dimensional scene, because that's where our shapes are going to initially be created. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Now, my work plane is currently oriented along the y, z axis. Okay. Now, watch what happens when I run the cone tool. The shape is going to be created on the work plane. See? I can make another cone, and that shape is always created on the work plane. Now, when I orbit down a little bit, the work plane changes its orientation. Now, because I changed my view, that work plane snapped to a different plane. Now it's along the XZ plane, also known as the ground. Okay? Same tool, cone tool. But now my cones are going to be made up like that. Okay? So the work plane has a direct influence on how each one of these shapes are created. Okay, You can't turn it off. The only way that you can turn its visibility off, but you can never turn its influence off. It's part of the core moto modeling structure. And personally, I can't live without the work plane anymore. It really is that powerful of a tool. Let me show you a really advanced example of why this is an important idea. Okay. If you come from other modeling packages, you're probably thinking, hey, where's that quad view? Right? You know, a lot of apps have that quad view that will show you the top, the left, the front, and like a perspective view of your 3D scene simultaneously. 
Well, we actually don't need that anymore with the advent and the creation of the work plane. Because the only purpose of that quad view is to help us to very accurately place and edit our geometry in those orthographic views. Well, the work plane, because it's, it snaps and because it changes its orientation based off of our view of the three-dimensional three scene, well, I really don't need to look at my scene from the top in order to make my, my cube or my cone point in the right direction. I just need to have the work plane oriented to that plane, and now my cone will be created with the spike pointed up. I don't need to look at my, the scene from the front in order to get the spike going forwards, right? Because I can just change my view. My work plane will change its orientation. And then I'm up, up and running. It makes it very fast, OK? Now, the other reason why that this work plane is pretty neat, and this is the, the advanced example, is the work plane, and I'm not expecting you guys to remember this, so just kind of look and watch. We'll get to this later on this semester. The work plane can be customized. We can change the orientation of the work plane based off of existing geometry. Since all, all of our shapes are created on the work plane, when I change the work plane's orientation to match like one of these polygons here, any shape will be created at that angle, right? Create this is the crazy. Maybe I want to have a whole bunch of, I don't know, like crazy spikes going around the top of my cone, OK? Without the work plane and other apps, this is literally your exclusive option, right? All right, so I can look at my scene from the front. Uh, actually, I'm going to look at it. Yeah, this will do. I'll go ahead and, and make my little cone, right? So there it is. There's my cone. I'll have to, let's see, I'm rotate it 90 degrees. Rotate it 90 degrees. There we go. And then I'll have to, like, okay, now I want it to be there. Look at it from the top. Okay, I'm already hating this. Okay. I'm already hating this, yeah. And now it's like, OK, I want the angle of my cone to match the outside angle of its other cone, right? So now i got to figure it out. Is that the right angle? Is that the right angle? So that's close. That's close. Well, that's cool, but maybe I want a whole ring of these, right? I just took me you know, a minute or so to do one. If I have 24 of these things that I have to do, now it's like 24 minutes just to get a ring of cones going around the top of this other cone. Boo, that's bad, right? No likey. I don't like that, right? But the work plane, thanks to its level of customization, allows me to do that with accuracy almost instantly. Let me show you how or what I'm talking about. I'm just going to grab that polygon arbitrarily, OK? And now, oops, OK, there it is, OK? That becomes my work plane now, OK? Because I hit that little button up there, OK? And now, because all geometry is created at the work plane, now I simply make a cone. And check it out. It's already matched to that angle. And it's also being placed in the center of that polygon for me automatically, which is pretty cool. OK, pretty neat. I'm sorry, can you say it again? If I select, yeah, yeah, so if you select a couple polygons, it's going to look at what's selected and put it, the work plane in the center of that selection. Okay. Great question. Can you do that again? No. Could that make it multiplied? What do you mean multiplied? Um. It's not multiplied. Yeah, it's following the angle that I set. And there is an angle property. Now that's pretty good. Okay. And each one of those cones, because I accurately aligned one, okay, when I did the array, and I have a spiky thingamajig. I don't know what that is. A thingamajig. It's the official term for it. Okay. Point being, this work plane is an important part of our modal modeling process. It's going to be a, a determining factor as to where all of our, our shapes are created. Okay? 
Another thing that we have to get really good at, and I want you to practice with me, believe it or not, is making perfect circles. Okay? Think about it. For a train this week, we need to have a couple perfect circles, right? A wheel is a perfect circle. Making a perfect circle inside of Moto is not hard, but there is a little bit of a sequence that we need to follow. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If I went over and grab the, uh, I'm going to grab the cylinder tool, okay, the third option up here at the top. I can left click and drag, but look, how am I going to create a perfect circle in this world, eyeball right? It. Eyeball it? No, no eyeball on it. I mean, that looks pretty good. That is not good, I can't even right? That is not good. No likey. I want perfect. I want perfection, right? Pat doesn't do close. Pat does dead on right every single time. Type in your values, which you absolutely can do. If you look over here in your tool properties, this radius size determines on both of these X and Y's, determine how close to a perfect circle this is. If they're not the same, it's an oval, okay, an ellipse. Um, you certainly could go in and copy that value, paste it in over there, hit return. Now we get a perfect circle. That's cool. You're more than welcome to do that. Here's a trick, and this is a good trick, and I want you guys to practice this just for a couple minutes, because if you, if you make 10, 10 circles using this method, you'll memorize it, okay? So here's how we do it. I'm going to activate the cylinder tool, okay? Turn it on. I'm going to simply left click. My tool handles appear. Now here's the hard part, and people get stuck on this, okay? Once our tool handles appear, we need to physically move our cursor away from the tool handles, okay? Can't be anywhere close. It's got to be a pretty good distance away, okay? Once our tool handles, or excuse me, once our cursor is away from our tool handles, then we press and hold the control key. And then left click and drag. And a perfect circle will be born at the location of our tool handles. Let's drop the tool, do it once more, okay? Fire off the cylinder tool. Single left click. Move your cursor away from the tool handles. Hold the control key down, left click and drag, okay? Now as you do this, I'm looking around the room. We are two-handed drivers in the Motorverse, okay? Start getting comfortable today having one hand on your mouse, one hand on your keyboard. Modeling gets a whole lot easier and a whole lot faster if we're driving a 10 to 2, okay? That's all a question. I want to make sure it gets answered. No, never mind. Rock and roll. Everyone just make a bazillion perfect circles real fast. If you're making perfect cylinders, your cursor is not far enough away from the tool handles. You should be getting disks like this. And also, I'm working in the cylinder tool, you're in the sphere tool. Yeah. I'm holding control. Okay, that's why. Yeah. Everyone just makes some perfect circles. You just deleted your mesh item on accident. No, not on accident. Okay, hit the N key. You will create a new mesh item. There you go. Now you have a container for geometry. Okay, try it again. This time, go ahead and click. Now move, no, yeah, move, before you hold down the control key, put your cursor like right there. It's going to make a cylinder again, okay? Let's try it again. Drop the tool, let's try it one more time. Okay, fire it off. Okay, now just clicky click, click. Oh, don't hold control yet. Click first. Now move it away. Yep, control, there it is, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Separate it. Now, were you going into the geometry? That's fine. We'll talk about that here in a second. We can combine them from one object into another. Yeah, this is going to be very difficult with a pen. But just FYI, possible, just give me difficult. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to, because when I do it with a pen, it's going into a sphere. Yeah. But so I'm trying to figure out what button combination and what thing does it with a circle. And I'm just trying to try the cylinder tool instead of the sphere tool. The pens often, uh, 
when you tap, you're actually tapping and dragging a little bit. Oh, I think I, think I figured it out. Great. If I screw this down, it makes it pretty obvious if I speed it up. <laughs> you got it? Emma's got it. Brianna's working her way. You get in a circle every time? OK. Yeah, well, it's making it at a weird angle because it's along the work plane. You see the grid, the light gray grid? Your circles, your shapes are always going to be created on the work plane. Yeah, it's never going to be in screen space. So it's never going to be a perfect circle to your vantage point. It's going to be a perfect circle to the 3D view. You got it? Now, you should be getting uh, disks. If you're getting cylinders that have a dimension to them, get disks. Okay. Takes a little bit of practice. That's why we're here, right? To get the v value radius also the same measurement as the other two radius measurements? Not that I know of, off the top of my head, yeah. Because if you're doing a cylinder, well, if you're doing a cylinder, the other dimension is going to be a length, not a radius value. Yeah. Try changing it. I've never actually changed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I think they just call it that. Yeah. For simplicity. Good job. You guys are getting it. We're making a train. Adriana's like, I know I can do perfect circles. Good, good. You guys are getting it. Well done. Okay. I know this sounds strange. Okay. 3D modeling requires a lot of muscle memory, okay? Yeah, and a tremendous amount of patience. It really does. No, seriously. This is going to be a whole lot harder than you think it's going to be, okay? Um, does anyone want to take a guess? Let's just take a guess. And this is, I'll try to keep it as accurate as I can. Does anyone want to take a guess how long it took me to make that train, my train? Uh, I wish it was 18 hours. More than that, it probably someone said about a week. Probably about a week of modeling, okay. And that's modeling every single day for about a week to get there, okay. This stuff takes a while. It takes a long, long time. Let's see. All right. I'm not sure if I have this project file with me. It's there, honestly. It is. Let's see. I don't know if I have this file with me. Let me see if I do. I make no guarantees. That'd be an interesting thing for them to have, is how long, like, how long it actually works on the file. I mean, it tells you when you first put in the file and when the last work was. Yeah, but like, it's not too messy. All right, bear with me just for two seconds, and I'll show you a great example of something that takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. Is that a flash drive? This is a flash drive, yes. What? It's my own. All right. Let me see if I can find a file here real fast. Yeah. Again, this is not to brag. OK. Oh, no, I had it here. OK, great. I had it and I didn't even know know that I had it. Okay, so check this out. Sometimes, sometimes your models take a whole lot longer than you think they're going to take. OK. This is a good, a good indication of how long things can take and how crazy and how deep of a rabbit hole this can go if you let it go, right? Sometimes you get obsessive about your models, OK? Time is relative, OK? Time is relative. This was not quick. Um, look at that. 
old Moto project file. Let me turn everything on. Okay. Okay. And this one, I'm trying to see here. And this one doesn't have the sales on it. So this is just the raw model itself. Okay. So, um, and all right. about to crash, so I'm not going to touch it anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's about to crash. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, it's not going to crash. It's locked my camera. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Oops. For some reason, I think my render camera, this is an old m version of a project file, an old, old one, very old, and it's wigging out because it's so old. Um, but these things can take time if you let it take time. This is the HMS Victory. I've had this model on my personal hard drive for many, many a year, right? Uh, this, is a this is a personal project. I've been working on this for a long, long time. This is, I remember the first semester I started teaching, um, as one does, uh, you discover that you have a winter break. And being a professional, a professional 3D artist, I had never had a winter break before. And so people went home after, after finals, and I was sitting there, and I was like, well, now what am I going to do? I'm not, I don't have work until January, right? I've never had a break that long before. And I was like, cool, what am I going to do? My, my wife at the time, well, she was working, so she went off to work. And I was sitting there, I was like, well, what am I going to do, right? <laughs> and I'm kind of bored, you know, you can only sit around for so long before you get bored. So I was like, well, I want to make me a model, right? And I started the HMS Victory. This is one of my favorite kind of tall ships of like the 1812 era, right? Uh, and I bought a book that had the uh, architectural blueprints of the entire ship, right? And I ripped all the pages out. I scanned each page. Uh, seriously, I ripped all the pages out. I scanned each page, brought them all into Moto, started making an actual scale model of the boat. Um, and that was my first winter break of teaching, and that was 10 years ago. <laughs> I, can, I can illustrate this idea that these things take time, if you allow them to, just by looking at the date created. <laughs> this particular model file is 2012 at 11.52 p.m., so... I am, I have, let's see, do I even have? That was the day it was last modified. Yeah, that was the day when this particular one was modified. Uh, if you were around last semester, I did some rendering. And uh, let's see, I'm up to version, I'm up to version 21. And uh, last modified in December of 2017. So you can work forever on these things if you allow yourself to work forever on these things. So I'll show you some renders of it later. I'm I'm done. I just need to render it out. Um, so how come parts of it is in purple and parts of it is in the, the standard black mesh and white? Yeah, we've only touched the surface as to the different item mesh item types inside of Moto. What you saw there in, in pink was uh, what's called a replicator. Or excuse me, what's called an instance. So we'll talk about that in the future. Yeah. How long did you not be able to render it? Well, that was the problem, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had a, I had a, I had a goal last semester, because I, I was like, finally, I'm gonna render this thing. I'm done. I made a scene. I animated it, and in my mind, I was like, done. 
right? I'm walking away from this thing and I'm not turning back. And I intentionally, intentionally waited until spring break of last semester, intentionally waited, right, to render this out. Because I knew that this room would be completely, you know, completely empty for a week, more than a week, about 10 days when you think about it, right? And no one was going to be using it. I was like, sweet, I'll network render on all these machines in here. I got 26 machines. I had, there's a lot of processing power. This will get done in a week, right? Guess how many frames I got to render? Yeah, I got about 100. 100 frames at about, I think, 1440. Uh, so I got, you know, just about 10% of it rendered when uh, someone either the, the computer's turned off somehow or the computer services guys remotely deactivated all the machines, which they do from time to time. Uh, oh, but that I, it, yeah, that could have been it too. The, the, those restarts had ha haven't happened before. Um, so I was, I was pretty grumpy when I came back from spring break, expecting to see this wonderful gift of the completed render sitting on this computer and to find that I only had 100 frames. I was pretty pissed. <laughs> I was really upset. <laughs> Anyways, OK. You have winter break. I do. I do. That's when you work on it for summer. OK. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Now that we have a little bit more control and mastery over using simple shapes, let's put this into practice. because. 3D modelers, we don't learn from watching a dude like me talk about 3D modelers. We have to get our hands dirty with it. We have to start building some stuff. So our lab assignment this week is our first kind of uh, foray into building something without a net, uh, you know, without a guide, if you will. If you return to Canvas just for a brief moment and look at the lab exercise, your goal, and this, we're, you know, this will take about an hour or so. We're not going to finish it today. You still have you know, some time over in the design lab this week that you'll use to finish this. But I want you to build me a Parthenon. OK? A Parthenon. Yeah. The Parthenon. This is the lab assignment. OK? Now, before you freak out and say, do I have to build like individual rocks okay, and individual stones? No. The purpose of this lab exercise is to paint with a broad brush stroke. Let's do some simple shape deconstruction here. So just by looking at this one image alone, what are the basic building blocks of the Parthenon? Cylinders, right? Lots of cylinders, OK? What else do you see in here, simple shape-wise? What was it? Rectangles, some big squares in the bottom that can make a foundation. All those cylinders got to sit on something, right? What about on the top? Yeah, some triangles. How do you make a triangle? Has anyone figured that out yet? Geometrically, think about it, OK? A triangle, if I make a circle, OK? A triangle is really nothing more than a three-sided cylinder, OK? With my cylinder tool on, check it out. I have this property over here that allows me to change the number of sides that are being used to construct my cylinder. If I put this to three, boom, triangle, OK? Step in the right direction. I'll let you figure out the rest. Okay. Um, here's another great little trick. There's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of these cylinders for for the uh, the columns on the Parthenon, right? Oops. Simple duplication. Here we'll just do it with that. Okay. So there's one. Maybe I want to have more than this, right? I don't want to make a zillion little col columns by hand. I make one. And then I can duplicate them. The duplication moto in e uh, system in Moto is really easy. Check it out. I got it selected. Edit, copy, edit, paste. Now, if you fire off the move tool the moment that you paste it in, there it is. OK? Let's do it one more time. I'm going to select it, edit, copy, edit, paste. Fire off the move tool, there it goes. Okay. You can. Command C, Command V will work. Kim and then E. You could, absolutely. Yep, the work plane. Yep, for sure. Yeah. 
you get a whole bunch more, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that. I like the way you think. That's a great way of approaching it. If you want to have, uh, you know, the exact same columns on like the other side of your Parthenon, you can select all three. Command C, Command V, W to fire off the move tool. Boom, halfway there. Okay, simple duplication. So here's what I, what I would like us to do for the next uh, 45 minutes. I want us to just get started on this. Paint with a broad brush stroke. Start building these shapes. Try to add as much detail as you think you can. Push yourselves, okay? And then we'll get back together and talk about the conclusion of our train and get ready for next week. Sound good? Ready, set, go. Two seconds.
All right, so if you're not quite done with your Parthenon, as I mentioned, don't freak out. You still have an extra 90 minutes of lab time, you know, a week that you're supposed to go to finish this in. So spend an extra 90 minutes on it. Get it close, okay? Try to make it look as real as you can. Try to suspend disbelief. As 3D modelers, this is our sole responsibility. The entire production is built off the imagery and the, the geometry that we create. So put some effort into it. Make it try to look real. At the conclusion, I would like you to make sure that you render this out. Save a JPEG and submit both the Luxology project file, excuse me, the Moto project file, and the render to the Parthenon lab assignment Dropbox when you're done. Okay? Now, we have one more component this week. Okay? And that's our homework. Our homework, of course, naturally is going to ask us to um, make our little train. The hard part about 3D modeling is figuring out the overall shape, okay? Especially when you're working with concept work or something that's unseen before, that's the difficult part, it really is. What's the overall volume look like? How big are all these pieces in relationship to, to each other? And how does this relationship create the illusion of a train or a tank or whatever, right? Reference is going to be our guide. I'm an old school 3D modeler. I fundamentally believe that all 3D models begin and end with reference, with research. In addition, I also feel that if you are not including re uh, research and reference images, you are doing this wrong. Okay, The fastest way to get an accurate, believable, and realistic result is to use photography and blueprints at every single stage of the game. You need to turn into kind of like a little miniature subject matter expert on the thing that you're modeling. You know, I could ask every, every single one of you guys to, uh, to make a 3D model of the car that you drive or of a car, right? And you'll be able to see that car in your mind's eye and your imagination. But once it starts to unfold and kind of materialize this 3D geometry in the scene, it's going to not look anything like a car, okay? It's going to look like a box with a couple cylinders associated with it. We take one step closer to the realism of our objects by incorporating reference, okay? We need more detail to understand the shapes that we're making. So reference is always, always, always the most important part at the early stages. If we can find good reference that we can use in the modeling process, we should do so, right? I've supplied you guys with an image that you're going to use as reference to build your train, okay? Now, this is an orthographic view of our train. From an image perspective, what don't you see in this image? The other side. The other side. So we don't see, this is not a perspective image of the train. It's a two-dimensional, flat illustration of the train, kind of of the side. So we don't get any sense of depth, but we do get a good sense of the dimensions along two out of our three axes. That's enough for us to get started, okay? And most importantly, the, re the, the reference tells us the spatial relationship between all the parts and pieces on the train. We don't have to guess, okay? We're going to use this in Moto as what's called a backdrop item, okay? And we're going to build our geometry on top of this backdrop item. I know it kind of feels like you're cheating a little bit. It's like, Patty, do you really want me to trace this? Yeah. Yeah, I do want you to trace this, okay? It's not cheating. It's part of our workflow. It really is, okay? We use reference as the core of our modeling sequence. So I want to show real fast how we can bring this image into Moto and use it as a backdrop item, okay? Which is a different item type inside of our Motoverse. Let's check it out. I've saved it, you know, so oh, FYI, I forgot to mention this. You can find this backdrop item at, in the resources section of this assignment. It's down here at the bottom. It's the link. And when you download this link, you're going to get this zipped archive. And I just did you the solid, and I unzipped it while you guys were on break, or while you were doing your lab stuff. All right. So I'm going to create a new Moto, new Moto project file. And the first thing that I'm going to do is create a container for my backdrop item. Okay. So we got to add a new item into the mix now. It's a special one called the backdrop item. So if we go right here, this little pull down arrow. Okay. We're going to add what's called a backdrop item. This is a non-rendering image, okay? So you're never going to see it in the render. Its sole purpose is to help us model, okay? 
So we're going to create the backdrop item. There's this icon. It's a cute little Mona Lisa. Okay. Let's give it a good name. Let's be a good steward of our scene. I'm going to call this reference train side. Okay. So let's go in and start loading. Oh, I misspelled train. So that's going to drive me crazy. Did I misspell train? No, I had it right the first time. It's the end of the day. My brain's getting train. How do you spell train? AI, right? Yeah. I know how to spell. Yeah. At the end of the day, I've been doing this since 830. My mind is literally getting getting soft and, and mushy around the sides. Okay. So with my with my backdrop item, don't drink the end. That's poison for your body. It really is the energy jinx. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> um, so with our backdrop item selected, check it out. Down here in our properties panel, we'll have the ability to load that image. Okay, this is how we do it. We load it in. Okay. This little image well here. We'll bring open, if we click on it, you're going to open what's called the Clip Browser, which is really just kind of a, a library of images that we get to use inside of Moto. All right? To load in that backdrop image, we do Add Clip, Load Image. Okay? Please, please, please do not select New Image. Okay? This is going to create a blank image that doesn't contain any sort of you know, pixel information in it. We want to load an existing image. Okay, so we'll load it in. It'll pop open the standard OS finder. And I think I saved mine to my desktop. There it is. And then we hit open. And look where it places it. Where does it place this backdrop item? I don't exactly want to get that. You got it. And more specifically, where? The At the origin. Okay. The default location for every backdrop item is going to be the origin of our scene, which is what we want. Okay. Now, there's a couple things in here that we need to change and switch around to make sure that our backdrop item is oriented correctly to our three-dimensional scene. Earlier, we went at length to describe some landmarks for us that define common points inside of our three-dimensional scene. Up, down, left, right, front, backwards, right? Now, I want to have the front of my train facing the front of my scene. Right now, if you look very carefully at my grid, is it? No. no. How do you know that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look over here on the, the boundaries of my grid, you can see x plus. Okay. So that makes this over here what part of the z-axis? Z plus. So right now, my train is, isn't just facing the wrong way. It's facing completely the wrong way. Okay. I want the picture of the train facing Positive Z. Okay, the front of the train needs to be facing the front of our scene. Now in Moto, there's a couple different ways that we can do this. And the easiest way to do this is by returning to our backdrop item properties. The guys and, guy, the guys and gals down at the foundry understand directly our modeling process. Okay, they've made these tools to integrate smoothly, cleanly into our sequence. So they've given this this, this really great projection type. This projection type does two things, okay? First and foremost, I'm going to change my projection type to, let's just do right. Aha, uh -huh. cool, huh? I changed the projection type from front to right. You can do left, too. That's fine. One of those is going to get you what I like right because I think I'm right-handed. So we've taken a step, a step further. We're closer to the result that we're after, right? I still want to have the picture facing the positive Z. Okay? Right now, it's oriented along the right axis. Good job. Okay, I like that. But it's facing the wrong way. Has anyone discovered the simple solution to my problem? Rotate it. We could rotate it, but there's even simpler. Oh. What was it? Flip. Flip. Okay. Oh. Right below our projection type properties. Okay. We have flip. The flip command is going to simply boop, flip the image. Okay. Now we have something to model with. Okay. So the first step when you bring in these backdrop items is to orient it to the scene, okay? to the entire three-dimensional space. We want the details of the picture, the front of the train, to be facing the front of our scene, which we've done here. 
Load image, you got it. And go find it. Gotta, go, gotta know where it saved it to your computer. Okay? Now this is just step one. Okay? Step two is now to do some, some analysis. Okay? Now if I look at my scene from the front, I'm not going to see anything. However, and this is the, the other side benefit of this projection type. Check it out. If I look at my scene from the right view, I'm going to see my backdrop, my backdrop image. There it is. Dun, da, da, da. Cool, huh? So our picture is only going to show up in two views, the perspective view of our scene and whatever view we've, we've uh, toggled in this projection type. That's a rule. It's not going to happen any other way. Okay. Um, it would be really great to be able to see through my backdrop image a little bit so I can see the, the grid and my geometry. Because right now, if you look carefully, it's blocking the entire grid. I want to see that grid. It's going to help me position this a little bit more accurately. Once again, in my backdrop item properties, if we keep cruising down the list here, we have transparency. Now, I like 70%. Pick one. 70% 70, 70 is a good place to begin. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now with that value changed, we can see the grid lines a little bit easier, which is pretty cool. Okay. Now the reason I want to make it a little bit transparent to see the grid is maybe I can reposition this backdrop item to help me. Okay. Um, you know, if you think about it, these are the railroad ties. Okay. Where should those railroad ties be kind of positioned in, in inside of our three-dimensional space? Yeah. Well, I would even say maybe in the middle of the y-axis, kind of on the ground a little bit. Okay, That way, when we create them, the train's already kind of sitting in the spot that we want it to sit in. That'd be kind of nice. Makes life a little bit easier for us. Okay, So we can move these things around simply by selecting them. I know my, my backdrop item is selected because I have this nice orange background. I can just move it up anywhere I want, right about there. Right there, there we go, that's good. I'm pretty happy with that, okay? So the first thing that we do when we're working with backdrop items is that we orient the backdrop item, which is the fancy word for rotate, right? We orient the backdrop item, the picture to our scene. The second stage is to place the backdrop item where we want it, to position it to the grid, okay? So that the height in the left, right, up and down is relative to where we want to have our geometry. And the third thing that we do when we're making backdrop items is to test it. It's to throw down some geometry and see if it works. Okay? Now I'm going to go and uh, I'm simply going to go back to my perspective view. Okay? And I'm going to fire off a cylinder tool. Oops, it's a three sided cylinder. That'd be a funny looking wheel. So let's make this uh, 24. That's pretty good. Now let's give it a little bit of depth. I don't know how big it's going to be, but I can always change it later. Let's go back to my right view and position this where I want it to go. Now that's probably pretty close. It's a little bit small, so what's the next step? We've got to scale it up, right? We've got to make it bigger. Does anyone remember the keyboard shortcut for scaling? R. R. Fire off the scale tool. I'll click in the center, and I can scale it up. Now, at times, it's going to be kind of difficult to see your geometry, okay? Especially if that geometry is sitting right there at the exact same location as your backdrop item. So here's a small suggestion that I would make to make it a little bit easier to work inside of Moto. There's one viewport property that I absolutely recommend that you change, okay? How do I get to my viewport properties? Oh. Oh, as in October. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Kim. Now that's going to be stuck in my head all day long. All right. So there's two things in here that I want to change. Okay. First and foremost, I want to make sure that overlay drawing is enabled. I'm in my drawing and control section of my viewport properties, and it's right here at the top. There's actually two of them that we need to turn on. Overlay drawing here. Bloop. And there's another one. If we go down a little bit under the background imagery section, also turn on overlay. 
Okay. Now what this does is that it starts to kind of project our backdrop item on top of our geometry. It kind of creates the illusion that our geometry is a little bit semi-transparent and we can see our work behind, uh, behind the image. Yeah, because now look, there's my circle and I can see the circle, or my cylinder, excuse me, and the image. Now I got some more wheels here that I need to make. How could I very quickly make those wheels? Copy paste. Copy, paste. So Command C to copy, Command V to paste, fire off the move tool. Bloop. Now I'm, I'm all zoomed in, so it wigged out. I'm like crazy. Let's try that again. There we go. Now I got two wheels. Copy paste. These inside wheels are a little bit smaller, so I'll make one. Copy paste, move it. There we go. I'm on my way. Now, yeah, it's all locked down. Yeah, once you once you adjust your backdrop image, you could lock it by right clicking on it and choose lock unlock. But if you just don't mess with it, it's not going to happen. Ain't nothing going to happen to it. Okay. Now, when establishing the proportions of this, let the reference image help you. Okay. Because there's some puzzles in here that we need to solve. Like, how big is that back cabin? I don't know. Really don't know. We're going to figure that out, right? But what could be maybe a, a helper in establishing me and helping me establish the size of the, the little house thing on the back of the locomotive? Could be the grid visually on the image itself. Is there anything that would help? Maybe. What about the main boiler itself? That's a cylinder, right? The main, that's a, it's a perfect cylinder. We know from the reference, it's a perfect cylinder. So if I make a perfect cylinder, There we go. Now, I really want this at the origin. Okay, The center parts need to be in the center of our scene. We model around it. I certainly could just look at it from the front and then move it that way if I'd like. That gets me close. I'm happy with that. Here's a great trick. This will be my last trick of the day. Sound like a magician there. Maybe I am. Center selected. Yeah. So I have that boiler selected. And I'll, I'll, I'll really push it away from my backdrop item so you can see it. So center selected. And if you simply push all, poof, now it's down there at the center of the scene, which is where I want it. I can move it into place. And I'll scale it down until I'm generally pretty happy with its size. It's still a little bit big. Okay. Now I'm looking at the front here. My eyeball is looking basically right here because I get a really good sense of the width, excuse me, of the, uh, the dimensions of, of the train right there. Something like that. That's really close. That's close enough for me. Okay. Now it's a little short, so I'll just scale it this way. And then I'll move it back, scale it up, somewhere right around in there. So now, on that one, one modeling operation, if I turn off my backdrop item, I, I have a good kind of marker as to how big that boiler is, OK? Because if that's the size of the boiler, well, let's turn my backdrop item back on. Well, how big does the, the cabin need to be? I'm in the cube tool. Same size, ish. Yeah, maybe a little bit Yeah. This is where we get to interpret. I want to do center selected again. Move it into position. Something like that. And now I'll just scale it up until I'm real happy with it, maybe right around there. And then I keep adding another piece and another piece. And I start comparing the new piece to what's been previously done until eventually I have an entire train. Question. Um, I was going to ask him, you know, we were talking about like the windows on that. Is it just yeah. like the individual polygons? There's a special way of doing it? Or is there 
and we're going to get to that special way, I think, next week when we start e talking about editing. I don't, want, I don't want to overload people on the first day. So at this point, you're the part of Polygon, so you can only jump on the next hour show? You could do that, okay? Or I'm going to ask you, and this is going to be difficult for a lot of folks, to return to kindergarten. I have, I have both the, uh, well, I have the absolute pleasure of having a three and a six year old in my house. And both of my boys are Lego super fanatics, mostly because I forced them to be Lego super fanatics, right? I'm a drug dealer. It is their drug of choice. And as me, the drug dealer, I hand, I, I get, if they want Legos, they're getting Legos, right? And uh, I love watching my sons play with Legos because something simple and as abstract as a couple little square blocks and very quickly turn into uh, a spaceship. A Coke bottle can turn into a rocket ship, a cardboard box, all of a sudden you draw a circle on it, it's now a racing car. Their imaginations run wild, and I love witnessing that every single day. And we need to return to that state here, that Lego mentality. If you're building this shape with Legos, okay, it's not just one cube. How many different cubes are there? Five, or more, perhaps, okay? Yeah, five on this side, maybe a couple more on some other walls. But we're going to construct this shape with a whole series of simple shapes. Okay, so I'll have like a cube down here. I'm going to do this quickly because I have run out of time. I'll have a cube there. I'm not going to extrude them just because I'm trying to do this fast. I'll have a cube here. It's okay if it's sloppy and if it doesn't work. You know, we can always edit it later. There we go. And I'll make another one. So I'm going on the top. There it is. Now I've kind of blocked in that shape with very simple cubes. Now, last thing. If you color that different, they're the same color, will it look like it's different shapes to it, or will it look like they're all connected? Uh, if it's all the same color, it'll look like they're all connected. Okay. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty neat. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you want to change the color of something real fast, because I know you guys are good to go. You guys select it, hit the M key, got to give it a new name. Don't leave it a default, make it blue. And then down here where it says color, make it blue. Or that's kind of a greenish blue. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. controlling it a little bit differently. When we animate, that has a much larger role when animation. Toggling the visibility of certain things on and off. It becomes an organi organizational system pretty quickly. Okay, yeah. It no. no. At this level, not yet. At the end of the semester, yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much.